As Governor of the Reserve Bank of Australia from 1996 to 2006, Ian McFarlane oversaw some of the biggest changes in the way the RBA ran monetary policy, that is, interest rates. The appointment has gone to Mr Fraser's deputy, Ian McFarlane. It was a significant change from how things had been done previously. Until the floating of the dollar and the deregulation of financial markets in the early 1980s... The market has endorsed the government's view, as that was, that uh, it was a correct decision to take. Interest rates were set by Federal Cabinet. The RBA's own actions were often cloaked in secrecy. In 1990, McFarlane's predecessor, Bernie Fraser, started the process of making the bank's actions more transparent, announcing the official cash rate after monthly board meetings. Short-term interest rates increased by seven percentage points between early 1988 and the middle of 1989. In 1996, Ian McFarlane and Treasurer Peter Costello signed a formal agreement giving the bank independence to set policy without political interference. McFarlane also introduced the 2 to 3% inflation target that still guides monetary policy. For the past 30 years, the bank's board has set the official cash rate based on the advice of the governor and the bank's internal economists. Last year, new Treasurer Jim Chalmers foreshadowed changes to the way the bank operates. Today I announce the first wide-ranging review of the setting of monetary policy and the Reserve Bank uh, since the current arrangements were instituted in the 1990s. The review has made a number of recommendations, the most contentious of which is that there should be a separate board that sets monetary policy, with six of its nine members being part-time non-bank staff. Not everyone thinks this is a good idea. Ian McFarlane is one of them. Ian McFarlane, welcome to 7.30. Well, thank you for having me, Laura. Michelle Bullock took over as Reserve Bank Governor on Monday. Her appointment has been portrayed as a sign of con continuity at the bank, but will she be facing a new challenge if these proposals go ahead? Uh, yes, uh, she definitely will. Uh, uh, but I'm not sure that most people realise that for several reasons. Um, uh, firstly, um, when the review was released, the Treasurer did the unusual thing of just announcing that he accepted all the proposals and, and did not put them out uh, for public discussion. Um, I think secondly, I think there's people have been led to believe that these proposals in the review are moving the Reserve Bank of Australia towards some sort of world best practice. Uh, that's not the case. Uh, it proposes a model for a central bank uh, for Australia, which is totally unlike any other central bank in the world. And um, thirdly, the review claims that its proposals are modest, uh, but they're radical and I think unintentionally so. They put forward the proposal that we conduct an experiment that no other central bank has conducted, which is giving the part-time members of the board uh, the majority of the votes in monetary policy decisions. Why do you think that is so radical? Well, if we've got to look at uh, central banks around the world, um, they all have boards. Uh, some of them are advisory boards and some of them are decision-making boards. Uh, ours, the Reserve Bank of Australia, has traditionally been largely an advisory board. Uh, the review proposes uh, changing that and making it a decision-making board with votes taken at the end of each meeting uh, and published at the end of each meeting. Now, if you look around at other central banks, the big ones, and by the big ones I mean, for example, the Federal Reserve Bank a board of the uh, United States, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan. They have decision-making boards, uh, but all the members of the board are full-time employees of the bank. They are full-time professional central bankers. Some other central banks, led by the Bank of England, have added some part-timers to their board, but in every case, the part-timers are a minority. The proposal from the review 
would give uh, the Reserve Bank Board, renamed the Monetary Policy Committee, a membership of six part-timers, plus the Governor and Deputy Governor, and the Secretary of the Treasury. So the part-timers would have two-thirds of the voting power. In fact, they've got twice as much voting power as the Governor, Deputy Governor and the Secretary of the Treasury combined. That is a very radical solution. That is unlike any other central bank. No one else has tried that experiment. Now, I, I think that's very bad policy. I think it's a leap of faith. It'd be fair to say, though, wouldn't it, that this process uh, that has been in operation in the past has come uh, under criticism in more recent years, or at least the decisions of the bank have been uh, criticised a lot more. Yeah, that's probably true. Um, of course, uh, they were always criticised. Even in my time, we copped criticism, uh, almost exclusively when we were raising rates. Um, but more recently, particularly during the COVID emergency and the recovery from it, the criticism has heightened. Um, it's not as though the Reserve Bank was criticised for being asleep at the wheel or doing nothing. In fact, it's the opposite. The Reserve Bank overreacted, as they've conceded. Uh, they overreacted by moving interest rates down to zero, uh, doing this thing called quantitative easing, which is the central bank buying government bonds, and particularly forward guidance. That was clearly a mistake. Um, so we have to accept that. Now we've got a, a cash rate of 4%. Uh, nothing unusual about that. That's probably below average. It's lower than it was during my whole 10 years. But the problem was getting from naught to four involved a big jump. But the, it was the naught that was the aberration, not the four. Well, getting back to the part-timers on the board, who might be chosen to fill those roles and are there risks in the process of appointing them? Um, if you read the review, you will get the impression that the part-timers would all be academic uh, economists from the universities. Uh, and that wouldn't be a great deal of help because the Reserve Bank's already a very academic institution with lots of PhDs from the best universities there. So you'd just be adding more of the same. So I wouldn't support that. Um, but also, if you read the review, at some point you come to a sentence that says, uh, they also would consider appointing people who had expertise in financial markets, in the labour market and the supply side of the economy. So once you do that, you open up uh, the floodgates. So just about anyone would qualify under one of those headings. Now, I'm not objecting to broadening the membership uh, away from academic economists, but Essentially, it just means we know even less about who is likely to be appointed. Um, what we do know is that the positions are going to be advertised and people can apply. <clears throat> they will have to work for one day per week. That's, a, that's not a lot of effort to put into a very big job, in my view. Uh, particularly since they won't probably have their own staff or own resources. And, and I think also tellingly, in all probability, they won't have had any on-the-job experience. Now, most people who reach a senior level in anything, when they look back, they realise that nearly all their accumulated knowledge, uh, they got it on the job, on the job learning. And so I think the... the uh, the part-timers would be at a, a great disadvantage in having to uh, make these decisions. And so that's why the idea of them having a bigger share in the decisions is so radical. So what are the practical difficulties in the way the system would work? Uh, what could go wrong? Well, greatly weakens the position of the governor. <clears throat> uh, future governors will be put in, well, they, they will have had uh, a lot of the decision-making power taken away from them and handed over to the part-timers. Uh, and in fact, it could, you could reach a situation, in fact, I think you probably would, where future governors would not be sure how the votes would fall at the next meeting. Um, 
So if you consider a governor appearing before the public or appearing before the parliamentary inquiry or something and being asked for a very frank statement about what the priorities for monetary policy were, they would be in a very difficult position if they didn't know what was going to happen at the next meeting. They'd have to be, I think, vague and have a bet each way. Um, and of course, uh, we couldn't rule out governors being outvoted at the meeting, um, in which case they would find themselves in the position where they were the public spokesman for monetary policy, but for a monetary policy they'd voted against. So how much conviction would they carry when they spoke? Um, and finally, the, the review spends a lot of time talking about accountability, that the Reserve Bank should be accountable for its acts. Uh, well, we know it's accountable now. Uh, we know if things go wrong or the public is angry. We know who they hold responsible. It's the governor, as the outgoing governor can attest. But under this new regime, if it were to come into force, the governor could legitimately say, it wasn't me, it was these part-timers who made that decision. It feels a bit like this is a bit of a fait accompli. How should the government and the bank now proceed? Well, the government should open it to public discussion. I remember previous uh, things like the Campbell Committee and the Wallace Committee, and they were always open to public discussion before the government accepted some of the proposals. They should have done it this time, they should now do it. Ian McFarlane, thanks so much for talking to us tonight. Well, thank you for inviting me.